Ready, set, go. Ready, set, go. Jennifer Nicolaisen, welcome to NC Raw. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate the invitation. We are broadcasting from your house, your dining room table. Uh-huh. Thank you so much <laughs> for having welcome, me to Asheville. Yeah, thank you for coming over. It was nice having dinner with you. Yeah, I was telling you that I need to get out here more. Um, and so, yeah, this is definitely going to be the first of many trips out to the uh, to what we like to call the big city <laughs> from where I come from. So, um, Happy to be part of that New Year's resolution. Yeah, absolutely. I told you, 100 podcasts. There you go. 100 podcasts. <laughs> um, what's your key like? What do you do? Where do you, how do you start? Yeah. I don't even know. Yeah. Uh, Seek Healing. So, <coughs> Seek Healing is a project that I co-founded. Um, it is a 501c3 nonprofit. We serve people who are at risk for overdose. That's our primary mission. That's why we got started. Um, and we do that by providing services 100% for free to anyone at any stage in the addiction healing process. Mm-hmm. This is something new in Asheville. It is new in Asheville, that's right. How did you, where did this idea come from? Like, how did Mm. you get this ball rolling? Because what you're doing is extremely unique. Mm. Um, And I attended one of your little, like, opioid discussion. um, Opioid opioid addiction 101. 101. Yeah, and that was just fabulous. So, like, where did all this start? How did all this come to life? Mm, Good question and a good story, I guess. A long story. You ready? I'm ready. (laughs) Well, it all got started about three years ago, summer 2015. Uh, One of my best friends from college, I went to UNC Chapel Hill, and uh, one of my best friends from that time uh, OD'd on heroin, summer 2015. She survived, was revived on the scene with naloxone. At the time, I was living in the D.C. area, and uh, for whatever reason, I was the person that she reached out to. Um, in the wake of that experience, and it really turned my world upside down. I, uh, you know, there's something about knowing someone and loving someone and understanding how they think, you know, understanding how they get from A plus B equals C. Like, I just had a level of connection and a, a bond with this woman that I understood how she processed things, and all of a sudden it was kind of like it brought this idea of a heroin addict from something far away from me and my reality and my experience right front and center real personal close to home somebody i love and care about anyway um how did you initially respond to that phone call yeah uh it was a crazy it was a a full two-day experience to be honest with you um she called she was uh she was really angry um she was angry that she'd been brought back a lot of um, suicidal intention active for her at that time in her life and um, I am not a psychologist my background is in analytical linguistics I was working in DC at the time as a project management consultant in the uh, energy industry a whole other world a whole other world yeah and so I'm like ah! you know like googling how do you talk someone down from suicide like as I'm talking to her and you know my heart bursting over this um, experience that she's going through and uh, I ended up just staying on the phone with her for as long as I could basically just not breaking the connection um, anyway I ended up uh, you know the long story short is I ended up partnering with her to uh, get her into treatment she had been to various treatment facilities um, a number of times I think four or five times and uh, she was just in a, in a really tough place you know burned a lot of bridges, uh, but we were both looking at the situation and knowing that if something didn't shift, she was going to die. So I partnered with her to uh, get her down to an alternative kind of um, detox treatment that worked really well. Um, Honestly, it was a a miracle. It was nothing short of transformative. But what we discovered in the wake of that process was, you know, as great as this clinic was and as amazing of an experience as she had, she got discharged, right? And then there was just like nothing, just this total vacuum of resources available to her um, in that critical period of transition and integration and healing immediately post detox. And um, it was a really hard road, to be honest. Her journey was a lot harder than I think it should have had to be. And we really started seek healing 
inspired by her and by that difficulty and the suffering that she went to went through um, so that other people don't have to have a journey that's quite that hard. Yeah, like um, you being somebody that had very little experience in dealing with a situation like that and trying to like navigate like those what's next, what do we do, how do, how do we how do we handle this situation from here? Where do we go from here? Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. I have any insight, like, number one, to, like, recognize that there was a lack of options or even, like, case management, Yeah. if you will, um, but then doing something about it, right? <laughs> yeah. taking, taking direct action. Is that something that you, that you typically would do? Like, what what influenced you to actually take action? Because so many, like, we have so many amazing ideas. Like, so many people have these, mm. like, beautiful ideas. But for some reason, like, we're restricted from moving forward on them. Turning around and actually implementing Yeah, them. and, like, just like we were talking, I was throwing out, like, crazy ideas to you over dinner, right? About, like, I'm not going to go into detail, but about, like, what my vision for, like, this podcast and where we're going to go. And, like, um, some of the, that stuff is, like, well, kind of, like, non-traditional, right? Like, not... Um, somewhat innovative and different mm. and so like what what influenced you to really take action like what was it that you said I have to do something mm. well to be honest it was a, I guess it's a combination of how hard that road was after her detox experience um, to be very transparent like we got into um, a relationship that felt very codependent in a lot of ways because um, I had helped uh initiate this journey and I felt somewhat responsible for making sure that it um, came to fruition in a, in a certain way like I had some kind of attachment to outcome with her journey which was so inappropriate and um, and it was difficult and painful you know for both of us and but even more so than that um, she ripped the blindfold off my own eyes uh, looking at myself um, being friends with her and supporting her through that journey uh, forced me to take a really hard look in the mirror and understand um, the ways in which my own addictive and compulsive behaviors were alive in my life. And, you know, I wasn't using a needle or opiates, but I was uh, in a pretty uh, serious addiction spiral with uh, prescription amphetamines at the time, um, addicted to work, um, addicted to really like as I started to peel back these layers seeking other people's approval and um just not uh not living my highest truth and, and being my best self and so I guess the answer to your question is that what sparked what what gave me the motivation to to really do something about this whole mess that I see in addiction recovery in the recovery industry in general um was partially a product of seeing just very clear gaps in coverage and like what she was able to access in her actual recovery journey post detox um and in a really big way this kind of transform transformational understanding for me that we're all addicts in some way shape or form um that there's really no difference um, we're all suffering and struggling in some way and confronting addiction head on is a powerful way to kind of shine that light in people's faces. And I, I really believe that it's this overdose crisis that we're facing today is kind of like the canary in the mine, you know, yeah. it's the, the bird that's making a lot of noise, um, to alert us to a problem that's much, much deeper, um, much more foundational to the way that we interact as an entire society. And that is something that absolutely gives me the passion to wake up every day and keep doing um and keep doing and keep doing and keep doing and the seek healing model is kind of focused on addressing that Exa that's right. exactly what you just described yeah so we see we're really oriented around the idea that addiction is a disease of the community so addiction is certainly a brain-based disease that shows up in individuals but if you really step back and understand the nuances and, com and complexities of what's happening in our world right now. It's in many ways more accurate to describe addiction as a disease of the community, a problem with how individuals within society are relating to each other. Um, we're seeing this more and more, you know, there's a lot of research to suggest that 
addiction is really fundamentally an adaptation to an unhealthy social environment. Mm -hmm. Where did you um, Where did you start? Starting the project? Yeah, because that's not well, good. Well, yeah. So. I, I guess I, I started with my own process, as I said, you know, I was kind of ended up confronting my own patterns, um, going through detox myself, and uh, fortunate enough to be in a different situation where I had uh, the privilege of providing myself with aftercare, what my friend didn't have, and what Seek Healing is designed to provide for people. So I went through that process, you know, beginning my own healing journey, and feeling really passionate about uh, this truth and learning more and more about it and just kind of like ravenously consuming everything I could get my hands on as far as all this research goes, you know, and Gabor Mate's work and um, the importance and the role of trauma and addiction and, and if you read some of Joanne Hari's work on chasing the scream and lost connections, understanding um, the role that loneliness plays in addiction, um, Cassiopo's work, I, I spent quite a, a few months just like reading and consuming and um, and to be honest, my co-founder, uh, Kyla Trainer, who lives in Nashville, I'm going to give her a little shout out right now, uh, had a literal dream, <laughs> um, <laughs> like a dream yeah. while she was sleeping, that we were going to start this thing together um, and, uh, and help people. So like, you guys were like friends? Yeah, we've we're, we're been like kinda... best friends from college, and she knew this other friend as well. Bouncing these ideas off of each other. Mm -hmm, and, kind of like mm -hmm. and she was watching the journey that I was going on mm -hmm. with our other friend, and um, just really inspired to, uh, you know, that maybe we can do this for more people, you know, we can uh, really step back and change the way that the whole recovery machine is working um, to give people more options and options that are going to actually serve them and serve to uh, elevate the whole world while we're at it. And so her dream inspired me to uh, start the state nonprofit in Virginia, which is where I was living at the time, right outside DC, and uh, from there we began the process of setting up a 501c3. Sorry about that. No worries. And uh, had a fundraising launch party in May 2017, um, where we basically just got like all of our friends and family together in a room, and we're like, "Hey, we have a great idea. Want to donate to it?" Anybody help? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We raised a decent amount of money that day. Um, and from there, it was uh, kind of a weird, long year of, we have this amazing idea, you know, the opposite of addiction is connection, like, think about all the things we could do, and casting a lot of vision, and dreaming really big, and, you know, beginning it started, uh, or our main focus was going to, we're going to build this app, you know, to facilitate connections um, online that people can then bridge into a real-life experience, and I won't even go into all the details, but it was... Uh, it was misguided in a lot of ways. You see the little friend I got on the back? Uh, I here? saw him come down. Yeah, we got Welcome to North Carolina. Welcome to the studio, ladies and gentlemen. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you want to give him to me? I'll take him. Yeah, we'll we can hang over here. here. I kind of like him. He's cool. Okay. We're hanging out. Um, <laughs> anyway, we went down this whole rabbit hole of um, we got to raise big money and you know build this big thing. I'm interested in that app idea, but like we can maybe yeah. talk later off. Yeah, you were kind of. Yeah, it, it, you heard, you saw me. Yeah, earlier uh -huh. over dinner, I was thinking, or uh -huh. it came up as you were talking about that. I would love to discuss that more. Okay. Uh, yeah, ultimately, you know, I really went down that road, and you know, actually got pretty far along in negotiations with a developer out in California who was all about incubating, you know, uh, ideas that are um, socially positive and oriented around social change, and it was going to be like a. $25,000 down payment, which was literally every dollar that we had raised so far, and the total cost is like 250 k and we're just like, yeah, we'll, we'll make it happen somehow, you know? <laughs> um, and I had a real kind of come-to-Jesus moment where I had to sit down and be like, is this the way that we do this, you know? Is this the way that we start to provide a safe space for people to does really... It, does it align with my vision? Yeah, yeah. Like, of actually helping people, you know? Yeah. And that, that's always been the most important thing for me as we've been putting all this together, is I want to I wanna see it really uh, show up in a real way for people, you know? I want to actually be helping people. <laughs> um, and that just felt so far away, and it felt like a irresponsible use of donor money to start there, so... Um, we pivoted completely and we're like, well, you know, let's prove that it works. Let's prove that we can gain enough traction for a user base first. 
um, let's start a program, like let's do this in real life, and we're like, where are we going to do it? And you know, there's this little place called Asheville, North Carolina that's full of open-minded, interesting people, um, there's a thriving recovery scene, there's, uh, we, we knew what kind of model we wanted to create, which I can, I guess, explain more, but a critical part of it is networking with what we call connection agents in the community. So these are small business owners and other nonprofit leaders who are already doing really cool things that people can get involved in, like yoga studios or um, people who run foraging hikes and martial arts studios and improv comedy clubs and bringing those people together to basically provide resources uh, to those who are in recovery. So Asheville is like a natural choice because it's full of um, folks who are doing really cool things like that. And so we, I moved here last year, about a year ago, um, and just kind of started from ground zero, like, hey, what's up? My name's Jennifer. I'm starting a thing. You want to be a part of it? Yeah. <laughs> Where did, what was the, who wrote the program? Like, what role did you play in writing the program? And like, how did that, like, what did that look like? And how did it come to be what it is today? Mm. That's a good question. And <laughs> I think the answer is that we're still writing it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's, uh, that's really the role that I've played in the project mm -hmm. is designing the program and pulling it all together. Um, mm. What does it look like currently? What does it look like currently? So again, it's all based on the idea that the opposite of addiction is connection. Mm -hmm. And not just what that really means, you know, I'm coming from this perspective. I, I asked you that because like, I heard you kind of deliver that message in the Opioid 101 training class and like that those words the opposite of addiction is connection is like kind of in the prior to meeting you in the recovery circles and peer support um places like that that's kind of like a catchphrase mm. right like i hear it all the time i hear people say it i hear, I hear people use those words all the time mm. but i don't miss their actions don't necessarily align with yeah. Their statement. What does it really mean? Like, what does it really mean what that the opposite of addiction is yeah. connection, right? Uh -huh. And I think what it really means is, like, we got to start looking at the ways that we're actually connecting with each other. So I think... I guess, like, how do you define connection? How do you define connection, yeah. right? Because in the, you look back the last 20, 30, 40 years of human evolution on this planet, and our culture of connecting with each other has absolutely not been able to keep up with technology as rapidly Correct. as it's progressing, right? Correct. We just live in a world where social media has totally changed the landscape of how we interact with each other. Social media and smartphones, right? Mm -hmm. And technology in general, you know, we're more likely to order something on Amazon rather than go into the store. Um, we spend so much of our time managing information flow on screens and, and off screens with each other. We're still focused on this kind of flow of information. And it's a beautiful thing in many ways. It's created this I mean, there's just so many incredible things happening in society right now. Um, but I don't think that you can deny that as much as this technology is freeing us up technically to do more stuff, we're also just tacitly less likely to interact with other humans as often as we used to be. And so there's something missing there, you know? And I think it's, you're missing it, you're missing the point if you stop there and say that it's, we're just not interacting with each other as frequently as we used to. We're also not interacting with each other with as much in the same way that we used to, with the same quality that we used to. What I mean by that is um, what I often teach in, in the workshops that we're doing for Seek Healing. I talk a lot about attachment-free connection. So if you think about most of the conversations and interactions you have on a daily basis with people, we're normally interacting because there's a point to interacting with this person in front of me. There's conditions there's, surrounding this conditions right or mm -hmm. expectations, expectations. Or, mm -hmm. i'm speaking to you right now because i'm gonna buy something from you or because i want to get you to like me or maybe i'm a therapist and i, I want to help you i want to fix you or you know i'm meeting you out in a bar and i, I want to take you out on a date and the whole structure of my conversation is going to be created oh, yeah. to get that yeah. outcome right what humans really need what our brains need to feel ha happy and really be healthy is an experience of connection that is totally free of any attachment to outcome. Mm -hmm. And that is so rare in our world that it's actually can kind of like knock the breath out of you when you experience it for the first time, especially if you've been in active addiction for a long time and you've given up 
on the idea that it even exists. Mm -hmm. Many people don't even know what that feels like. Yeah. And what you're the, what you're attempting to tackle is like rewiring of this like habitual pattern that we've lived for most of our lives. Yeah. It's a challenge. Yeah. No right? kidding. <laughs> like where do you start? <sighs> yeah, I guess this all started because you're asking me what, what what do we do? Like what does the model yeah. actually look like? <laughs> I mean it starts with that, honestly. Uh -huh. It's starting with uh, the whole model is coming up with and implementing creative ways to tackle that mm -hmm. thing that you just described. So the way that I first tackled it was designing this thing called listening training, which is a two-day retreat that teaches you how to listen better to yourself so that you can listen better to other people. Which I've heard phenomenal things from, from the few thank friends you, you. that I know that have attended. It's pretty awesome. Anybody out there listening right now, you can go online to our website, seekhealing.org, and uh, sign up for the next round. Right now, we're only offering it, only able to offer it, um, once every other month. It's a, a two-day retreat, basically, mm -hmm. two full eight-hour days. Um, but as we move into the spring here, I'm looking at offering it much more frequently where uh, as more and more people in the community are stepping up to be a part of um, assisting and teaching and, and getting this information out there. It's, it's powerful material, you know. So we spend part of listening training talking about harm reduction, um, reframing addiction. We uh, talk about this concept that um, connection is at the heart of addiction recovery, that social isolation is what leads to addiction. Um, but I'd say that's like 25% of it is teaching those types of concepts, um, talking about trauma and addiction and all that. And the other 75% is spent in exercises. So interacting with other people who are in the training, uh, going through guided exercises or games. I call it, sometimes I'm criticized for calling them games because they're not always fun. Um, <laughs> but the purpose of these exercises is to start to break down, okay, how, do, how, do, how is it that I really show up in conversation? looking at the parts where I'm speaking and the parts where I'm listening and starting to break down where, when I'm speaking, am I performing mm -hmm. or trying to prove something about myself or about the world. And so you're doing this exercise, but you're really looking at your own behaviors. Through the container of the exercise, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kind of forces you to take a, a hard look at how you show up in conversations like What's that. What's up? You want to do it right now? Yeah. Okay. Um, hmm. So... Uh, <clears throat> what I would offer is that these exercises are supposed to draw our attention to what I call the we space. So normally in everyday conversation, it's you and I talking, or right now what we're doing on this podcast, you and I are talking and we're talking about a third thing, which is seek healing. It's a triangular conversation. You're asking me yeah. questions about how it started. Da, 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 da. So what we're going to do right now, if you want to do this, is yeah. we're going to drop into we space, sure. literally all that's happening right here, right now for you and I. Yeah. Okay? I'm ready. You ready? Uh-huh. Okay, so just hang with me, right? I'm going to say, being with you, I notice, and I'm just going to say whatever is, like, actually noticeable right now in this moment, and you'll reply with, hearing that, I notice, and we'll just go back and forth until we get sick of it. Okay. Okay? Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. So, mm, being with you... I'm aware that we're talking to each other through microphones and hearing our voices through the earphones. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of weird and great. Being with you, I noticed that you might be a little bit nervous right now. Mm. <laughs> hearing that, I feel seen. And also, like, I want to tell you that it's not, maybe it's nervousness. I feel like my blood moving really fast inside my veins. And I would call it excitement. Um, and I, but I feel like you, like very seen, like you saw that in me. Hearing that makes me feel very comfortable. Hmm. Hearing that makes me feel curious that you were so interested in my comfort. Hearing that makes me feel like this is going to be a good podcast. <laughs> Hearing that makes me laugh. And now I'm thinking about how when I laughed, it made a weird sound in the microphone. <laughs> I don't know if they heard that on there. <laughs> Whatever, they can skip this part. Hearing that makes me know that we're doing a good job. Mm. I think we're done. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. So how long does that typically go on for? Like just It depends. Well, that kind of exercise, so if I were facilitating it, I would 
probably give the pairs like a minute or two mm-hmm. minutes to do that. And there's so many different ways you can play that. Like that's just one. Yeah. yeah. Example. How many different but, exercises? Oh, there's. I mean, dozens. I've played yeah dozens. Okay. Yeah. So you complete the two day retreat. Mm-hmm. You become a listener. Uh, no, you're a seeker. Everybody's a seeker. Everybody's a seeker. There was a little bit uh, in the beginning. There, there was. Okay. You've been around long enough so, to know that. <laughs> um, so you become a seeker, right? You get your two-day, what, certification? We do. Uh, we have a little certificate uh-huh. that we give you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What is that? What do you do? Then you're just a part of the community. Awesome. So, um, so a seeker, just to like back up and outline what that uh, definition is, it's you don't have to go through listening training to be a seeker. In my opinion, you're a seeker if you're committed to the journey of constantly reevaluating your relationship with chemicals and behaviors that don't serve you. Um, so that is a wide range of things, right? And that could mean I stop using heroin, but now I'm reevaluating my relationship with work and with coffee and other things that I tend to be addictive and compulsive about, or maybe I never struggled with substance use, but I'm reevaluating my relationship with food or screen addiction, um, and these things come and go, right? They ebb and they flow, and some days they're easier than others, especially after you give up or choose to abstain from a more serious drug habit, and now you're faced with, uh, you know, these behaviors that are a part of everyday life, and um, we're in a position where we just constantly have to evaluate whether they're serving us or not serving us. So a seeker is anyone who's committed to that journey. Is the goal to get everybody to go through the seeker training? Yeah, yeah, we hope that everyone goes through listening training. Just so that, because when you're in community with each other in these different events, that like everybody is yeah. kind of on the same page and exactly. there for each other and like authentically connected, I guess. You mm-hmm. would say. Exactly, and you're kind of primed with the the basics or the, the point of why we're doing all of this. Because mm-hmm. much of the rest of the program and the events that we're doing and the seeker pairings, which I guess I'll explain in a second, um, are simply a forum for practicing this idea of connecting authentically um, and giving you a space to do that with other people who get it too and are trying to bring that practice alive in their everyday life. So what's the difference, like, what's the big difference between, like, peer support and... And a seeker pair? A seeker pair. Yeah, so... Um, I guess what is a seeker pair? First? Yeah, <laughs> so a seeker pairs are, uh, once you've gone through listening training, um, we match you up with another seeker in the community to have a space where you can meet every week. You commit um, through forming this pair that you're going to meet every week simply for the purpose of practicing authentic connection, practicing these skills of how do I listen without planning what I'm going to say next, um, practicing the skill of not just automatically giving somebody advice, practicing the skill of holding space for someone when they're having a difficult emotional experience rather than trying to fix it or make it better. Um, these things all take practice, especially because we live in a world that doesn't really teach us how to do that. So uh, that's what a seeker pair is. It's different from peer support, um, namely in that we don't require that everybody involved has gone through substance use uh, trouble in their life. Um, we also There's also no barrier to attending listening training and coming into one of these pairs. The only real barrier is being able to sit through eight hours of training, which for some people in early recovery is really challenging, and that's actually part of why we're moving towards modularizing the listening training so people can attend in shorter two-hour bursts. Um, But it's really intended for everyone, no matter where you're at in the journey, like you're going to take something away from this um, that's going to be valuable to your recovery and to your healing process. Whether so, you show up to seek healing events or whether you, or you partner just, with a seeker. Or, exactly. Or you, you know, come and that's the yeah. last time you interact with the material. Um, what is the screening process when you pair it to together? Like, how do you, who question. decides and how does that, what does it's that process look like? Consensus it's a consensus decision and program management right now. Um, it's uh, evolving. So we're trying to collect data and do research as we're going to understand um, going into it, like what kinds of people match up better. But honestly, it's mostly done um, on intuition. We also ask for um, any requests or considerations from seekers as we're pairing them. So especially if people have gender preferences or um, certain things that are triggering for them. But otherwise, we just uh, try, see if it works. There's always the um, invitation that if this doesn't feel good or if there's bad vibes for any reason, y'all please let us know and we'll pair you up again. And there's also, we set it up with the um, 
intention that you can this is going to shift right like you're not this isn't going to be your person forever like you can switch it up in a couple of months try meeting with somebody else it's all good um do you follow up with each seeker in on an individual basis like yeah so at this point the way the community is growing and at the size that we're at right now which is we have somewhere between 50 and 60 active participants boom yeah i've been growing um there's so the community really breaks down into thirds there's like a third of people who are region or like by like the reason why they're in CQ. Okay. And a third of people are in very early recovery, so less than six months past an overdose, past their last detox, past a medical addiction treatment program of some kind. Another third are um, folks like myself, I think uh, you identify as well as someone in long-term recovery. Mm-hmm. And then the last third are people who um, would not identify as in addiction recovery, maybe have never struggled with a substance use problem before. Uh, but um, are struggling with isolation in their lives for other reasons. So one of the most beautiful things that has come out of all of this is uh, we're seeing people who have connection needs going unmet outside of addiction, right? The biggest one is older adults, um, so people who are in retirement, kids leaving home, um, feeling isolated and disconnected in their lives, getting a lot of value out of coming to seek healing and connecting um, with people who are in need in another way. So. Folks in that category, folks who've um, lost loved ones to addiction, to overdose specifically, want to get involved and be a part of the solution. Um, yeah, so we have, so you asked how do we keep up with all these people. So uh, for the folks who are in very early recovery, we have a separate program track that's available um, if they wish. It's not mandatory, it's all, everything is entirely volunteer, but there's a separate scholarship program available called our Extra Care Program. And that's provided, everything is provided 100% free to program participants, but for people who are in the extra care track, they have access to direct services like acupuncture, body work, counseling, um, all kinds of things where uh, still point wellness, do they do those sensory deprivation floats? Um, I'm so like, interested that. in that. It's so cool. Have man. you done it? Oh yeah, that was actually probably the thing for me in my early recovery. That's um, really you yeah. I'm like, well, yeah, time. before I moved down to Asheville, I went to, oh. yeah, it's a, it's a game changer, especially if you've, have you ever been given the ADHD diagnosis or anything as like that? As a child, yeah, teenager. I've been living under it as well, and I don't know if that, whatever that all means, but if, if, for me, it was just like the most incredible experience of relief, like having all of your senses turned off mm-hmm. for 90 minutes. It's just because, a, it's like, thing. I have a meditation based Mm. recovery approach and like much of like the practice is to like sit through these sensory experiences you know what I mean so like you know you're sitting with your eyes closed and focusing on sound focus yeah you hear a sound or the wind's blowing or a car drives by and it's like that awareness and being present like through that awareness and so like I've just read a lot um on the sensory deprivation tanks it's mm. something that like like meditation like 2.0 yeah you know, like, <laughs> take it to a whole other level um yeah it's a, but i have never made it out here to do it oh uh, you gotta go sometime yeah, i go with so you cool. they're good people out there yeah it's so cool all right pardon me carry on that's okay i forgot where i was um <laughs> the resources that are you guys are available or that you are connected with in the community yeah oh yeah yeah which is a way of answering your question about um How do we keep up with people? A very long-winded answer to this question. Um, As I was saying, those things like sensory deprivation and acupuncture and all of those things that come with a fairly significant cost, we're offering those on scholarship to people who are actively at risk for overdose. Um, But this other two-thirds of the community is really important, right? So the answer to your question is we have a dedicated staff member now who's uh, responsible for following up with people in the extra care program on a weekly, sometimes daily basis, um, providing this extra layer of accountability and support and program management. Um, you know, I'm sure you know of it in early recovery. One of the hardest things to do is you know manage your time, book appointments. So uh, they're there to kind of help with uh, scheduling the acupuncture appointment, letting you know two days before, reminding you four hours before, following up with you after, kind of thing. So case um, management. Yeah, basically, yeah. I, I shy away from that word because I find it to be 
a little bit uh, othering, you know, like kind of creating a, a distinction between two seekers, um, the seekers just in service of the it's other. A barrier in that connection. It is. Yeah. It really is. The instant that you have one person who's well and qualified and another person who's sick and needs help, you know, you're already blocking a really judgment-free connection from occurring. So, mm -hmm. Anyway, then the rest of the community, uh, it's kind of evolving, like how we all keep up with each other. There's, but it's happening very naturally. There's, you know, people who kind of are rising naturally as um, hubs of, or like, centers of social gravity within the group. Um, I've certainly played a, a large part in kind of bringing people together. And But as we grow, there's more and more events happening organically. We now have an events committee that's putting on, um, you know, different gatherings and socials that happen throughout the month. So, uh, you know, it's we interact in a private Facebook page, and there's also just a lot of group texting that's happening, and people just being very intentional about connecting with each other. And it's kind of like setting aside in your mind, you know, we, I think it's become very socially acceptable for us as a culture to set aside time to go to the gym, because we know that we're sitting in front of the computer all day, not moving our bodies. Folks in Seek Healing are committed to the idea that you have to, like, work out your connection muscles, mm -hmm. so to speak, your, your social needs need to get met in the same way that you go to the gym. So um, everyone's very intentional about uh, making sure that these events are happening and that we're all hanging out and meeting up with each other. It's it's pretty cool. So the seekers meet, you said, once a week? In their pairs. Together the pairs. Yeah. But then you have these social gatherings. We have social gatherings and um, more and more we're adding these like direct connection training events, um, okay. I would say, like the modular listening training and um, game nights where we play these authentic relating games and exercises on a weekly basis. Original recovery is a big part of the weekly offering. Mm -hmm. Have you talked to Riley yet? I had a phone call, a phone conversation with him yeah. a while back. It's been a while though. Be a good person to, to yeah. talk to on here uh -huh. too. Yeah, he the, just the way that he facilitates that meeting is very in line with the idea of authenticity and connection. It's um, a non twelve step oriented approach to recovery, where um, or to a recovery meeting rather. Uh, where it's crosstalk, so to speak, is encouraged, and people are um, really just speaking about whatever's alive for them right now, um, and it's facilitated in a way that allows people to be vulnerable and um, get mirrored reflection without judgment. Um, so it's also like a really great example of the type of connection we're trying to facilitate through Seek Healing. Now, do you guys have like a a home or do you have a where do you guys do we're outside? working on it yeah. we're working okay. knock on wood i'm working on signing the lease here sometime in the next month or two uh, okay. to be continued all right um what was how did what was the reception like like when you first rolled into town in <laughs> Asheville, right um how did you how did you go from what was that like a year year and yeah, a half less than a year ago. less than a year ago to having 50 to 70 seekers involved in a regular basis. Like that's some significant growth in a yeah. short period of time for a, a brand new model, right? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, it's kind of mind blowing when I sit back and think about it. Yeah. Um, Cause like, I think like, I want to say that I had seen it on Facebook, but somebody else like within like a day or two called me or text me about it that they saw it like on a poster in a bathroom somewhere mm. at a coffee shop or something um somewhere but, like how did you how did you get the message out that you were like doing something different and like was there any resistance to like because mm. like it's a good question you know i come i spent some time in south florida when there's a lot of like questionable recovery industry mm. um businesses going on down yeah. there and like Asheville is kind of like in the last couple of years we have a strong recovery community but at the same time there's, there's a little bit of that kind of like a lot of money being made in recovery there's a lot of money being made in our backyard and so like was there any have you experienced any type of resistance or to mm. like, you know, you know what I'm saying? I do. You're, you're asking the juicy questions, Steve. I like it. Um, 
Hmm. I'll say it was a lot less resistance than I perceived we would encounter in DC, which is part of why we chose Asheville to come and incubate this. It was less than you perceived in DC. Less than I perceived in DC, and it. I guess that's a little bit different from the question that you're asking. That what I that answer that I just offered has more to do with the way that people are oriented to addiction culturally mm -hmm. in DC versus Asheville. I feel that people here, or just in general, even people that you meet on the street are just more likely to be a little bit vulnerable and honest about what's going on for them. Um, my experience of culture in other places, not just DC, but outside of Asheville. <laughs> Um, is just a lot more shame around, especially around socially acceptable addictions like drinking and workaholism. And, um, so I just, we initially perceived that this was a much more open-minded community. Now, in terms of how it's been... Or like, how, what did you, how did you like sell yourself? <laughs> like how did you deliver it in a way that less than a year later you got 70 people showing up? Like, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know that I have a good answer to that question. I uh, I have just lived, slept, and breathed this idea. You worked your honestly, ass off. I worked my ass off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it started literally completely by myself. I, I live here with my partner uh, Joshua. We moved here together, and he's on the board. Um, and as I mentioned, my co-founder Kylo lives in Nashville. Um, and uh, we have another co-founder who's uh, named uh, Dr. Rachel Worsman. She's a neuroscientist. She did a really cool TED Talk that just hit over a million views last week, by the way, oh, yeah. which is super cool. You can find it on your um, website? You can find it on our website, yeah. seekhealing.org. Um, so I had that support, you know, but as far as, like, getting out on the street, like, literally designing flyers in PowerPoint, because I don't know how to use Photoshop. <laughs> and printing them and like counting the dollars because color printing is mm -hmm. expensive mm -hmm. and you know not even knowing what what businesses to hang them in like you have no idea like where the rooms even are like we're, I kind of started to go to some meetings you know and um, started to get to know people and uh, I don't know the, the vision was just really big for me you know and we had spent I had, I had spent that whole prior year um, fundraising thinking we're going to build this app and stuff so I was can I, I guess maybe the shortest answer to your question is I just never once doubted that this is going to be what it is now, and honestly, more than what it is now. I still feel like we're in this phase of, um, like, the baby has just been born, you know. Uh, we haven't even hit the toddler years yet, and, and that gets me excited, and, and I think maybe that's just palpable. Also, it just makes sense. You know, I, I find myself sitting in conference rooms and you know, talking to county commissioners and people in positions of power in the recovery and rehab industry here in Asheville. And I sometimes find myself, you know, I've gone through all these slides, we're having like an hour long meeting and explaining all the research and the science behind what's happening in your brain when humans have connection oriented experiences. And at the end of it, it's just like, well, be nicer to each other, <laughs> like really listen to each other. That's all that I'm saying, you know? Mm -hmm. And so really it's, it's simple. It's, it's simple. But it's challenging. Mm -hmm. Like we get people get caught up in the um, emotional, you know, kind of, and they just can't. I don't know. It's just like it's it's easy to present. It's easy for me to understand it. And then put me in a challenging situation. How do I demonstrate? Where I actually it? have to practice it. Where I have to sit next to my my brother, my friend, my son, my daughter who's struggling with addiction and not other her, and yes. not just not other her in the sense of not, you know, telling her her behavior is wrong, but really, like, the harder part is even not being attached to the outcome of her recovery, you mm -hmm. know, not taking on responsibility for that. This is about becoming a healthier human being in every sense of the word, you know, interacting with each other with integrity um, so that we can really experience that juicy, feel-good mm -hmm. connection. It's hard. It's so hard. <laughs> um, and I guess that's where, like, why those those little exercises are so valuable and, and like are there techniques and things that you like like homework like things that they can do on their own like practice at home kind of stuff yeah there, I, mean, I don't really do homework so, so, but home, you know, definitely like, these exercises I mean I live my whole life in this practice now yeah. you know and there's ways that you can bring it into every moment of interacting with other people there's also there's lots of techniques so those games come from a 
a model called Authentic Relating, mm -hmm. real creative name. Uh, there's a really great resource online for those games, Authentic Revolution. Um, there's a practice called circling that's pretty alive here in Asheville. The Circling Institute um, puts out some really great information and practices about how to be in a group of people and stay in this like very present moment. It's almost like uh, meditation during conversation is mm -hmm. like one way of thinking about it, right? Um, Nonviolent communication, NVC, is a, a practice that's also very aligned with everything that we're talking about. Um, and that has a very, um, there's a big community of folks here in Nashville who practice and teach NVC. So all of these techniques are definitely portable outside of the container of listening mm. training. Um, one of the questions I'm sure you asked a lot is like, how is it funded? Mm. Right. Yeah, yeah. So we're funded about um, half and half uh, through a partnership with the state um, and half through private donations. You guys do like fundraising events throughout the year? We do. Getting ready to plan something? Yes, sir. I just <laughs> finished presenting the fundraising plan for this year to our board about a month ago. So I'm going to be hustling and hitting the streets here. Uh, uh, yeah, we have a big raise ahead of us this year, this calendar year. Where do you see this thing going? We're going big. Long-term long -term goals. Like, I'm going to build a next? healing hub out in Silva is what I'm okay, thinking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For real though. Um, so, I mean, joking aside, I my goal this year is to grow the program to being fully autonomous and operational here in Asheville in a non-residential way. So what we have now plus a physical location um, that's open in a, a non-residential, you know, I don't know, 7 to 9 p.m. or something like that. Um, and really flesh it out. So we'll need to bring on a couple more paid staff members probably. I really want to buy a bus and paint it in really cool colors and give people rides to recovery events and uh, seek healing gatherings. So, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, that's what's needed. So much, there's so many people who uh, struggle with transportation and early yeah. recovery, you know. So anyway, I have a, you know, I've targeted a burn rate for what that like kind of fully complete non-residential program would look like. And that's the goal for this year. And then from there, my the dream is to uh, replicate that in other cities. You know, once we have a really clear model, like this works, this is how you empower people. <coughs> Excuse me. Is that, what did you call it? The, the crud. The crud. Yeah, man. We're both battling it. You guys heard me on Monday night. It was rough. <laughs> it was rough. It's that time of the year. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I told you, I normally like, fight it. It doesn't, mm -hmm. I, I normally don't get it, man. I don't know what's going on. Um, <coughs> it is what it is. Is there anything else out there like what you guys are doing? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Not that I'm aware of. We've seen, I mean, there's certainly other, there are a few other organizations who are um, playing with this idea that the opposite of con uh, addiction is connection and, you know, how can we uh, execute that in a more clear way. Phoenix Multisport in Arizona is one that comes to mind. Um, some of the things that they're doing in Iceland, we were talking about that over dinner. Um, but as far as the authentic connection piece, like this piece of what is the quality of connection that's missing in everyday life, um, I don't know that there is anybody else really. And one of, one of the big um, milestones for me this year was bringing uh, Dr. Gabor Mate onto our advisory council. I really see him as kind of um, the father of harm reduction work in a, in a big way, but also in really understanding the role of authentic connection and trauma and healing from trauma. And uh, he, I asked him that same question, you know, like, is there anybody else that's really doing this, or what are those other organizations, and how can I meet them? And yeah. my like, guess is like, <laughs> my real question is why? How come no one else is doing yeah, this? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. It's happening now, so that's good. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the rest of my answer to your question before I started dying from that cough was that um, uh, eventually uh, I want to build residential facilities um, with a detox component, um, facilities built on farmland, hopefully out in rural areas uh, where people can get the experience of living in community and sharing the land and working together uh, for short-term stays, you know, as long as you need after your detox to start to heal and integrate. Um, and then we'll have natural bridge programs back into uh, reintegrating in the community with a non-residential program. I think there's something powerful in teaching those skills, those connection, authentic connection skills, day one. Mm -hmm. right? like, um, like literally from the time you begin the, the 
detox process and start learning and practicing those skills as best you can. I think that there's really something uh, powerful in that. Yeah. That can kind of like sustain and continue to allow the individual to um, continue to grow and like yeah. get, 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 getting at it as early as possible. Getting in there and teaching that as early as possible in you know facility like what you just described. Yeah, I I really really just think you're absolutely right about that, Steve. I um I've seen it. Yeah. We have the um yeah the, the, just leave it there. I've seen it firsthand, and uh, the difference is that it's empowering yeah. rather than uh, rather than you're sick and you're getting better. Like honestly, I, I we choose the word healing very intentionally over recovery because in in that sense. Um, it's not like you're having to recover anything or get better from something. This is actually an empowering experience where you get to choose the kind of life that you want to live. And through um, experiencing this type of connection that isn't holding you to an expectation um, or expecting that you behave in any kind of way, there, it actually creates this whole space for you to show up. Um, you know, imagine providers that aren't. Uh, telling you that this is what you need to do on this day, this is what you need to do on this day, but rather just bringing compassionate care, like, uh, you know, you're not feeling well, here's food, or here's a cold cloth when you need it, or um, here are things that you need to feel supported, but you choose how you're going to turn around and stand up and, and become the kind of person that you want to be in this world. And it's a practical skill that you can apply to all aspects of your life. It doesn't just support your recovery. Yeah. It doesn't just support where you're healing or wherever you are in the process, but it's something that you can literally apply to every relationship, whether it's the um, guy at Dunkin' Donuts serving you your coffee or your mom and dad on Christmas dinner. Like it's a it's a skill that you can continue to foster, continue to grow, and to continue to apply and then experience the results of that. Exactly. Experience what it does, you know, um, the the wellness that it provides in your life, like I just, I don't know, I just, yeah. I don't, I, I just don't understand exactly why, right. I don't understand why it hasn't been done, like, <laughs> like why are we doing, why is it 2019? I know, right, right? I know, it makes you a little sad to think about, it, but also I think it's just, uh, you know, things that are moving really fast, we haven't had time yeah. to sit down and think about this stuff. Yeah, but like, at the same time, like, we, I was sharing earlier that like, there's something about like that fast-paced, like, tech thing that I think that there's like if we can if we can learn how to use those uh, they're phenomenal tools right like you hinted at like the app thing mm -hmm. there's phenomenal tools out there that we can use once to not do the same thing but to like to our benefit yeah to our overall wellness I to think the, to, make to it, the benefit of our overall wellness. Yeah. Right? But we have to learn how to do that. I'm like, I'm super fascinated with that. And I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what the answer is. Yeah. But it's something that I'm like. I think it's where we start to, I mean, not to put you know, words in your mouth, but my take on it is I think it's where we, the difference between being intentional about how we're using technology and just letting the technology kind of guide the way that we live our lives. I, I think I was mm -hmm. even talking about this before we turned on the microphones as well. Like, this idea that most of us get these smartphones and we just take them as they're given to us, like with all the notifications preloaded and the way that the phone communicates with me, I just accept it the way that it's given it to me. It communicates with you the way that they, they want that it they, to. Right, right. And maybe there, you know, maybe there's a they and they were very intentional about, yeah, we're going to get all of their like attention and focus. Or maybe it's just like how the programmers no, did it and they didn't really think twice about it. But, <laughs> but I think, but, right, like... Uh -huh. it, the point is when I get it, like, am I going to take control of this piece of technology and use it in a way that's going to serve me? Mm -hmm. It's the same as, you know, reevaluating your relationship with a chemical. Like, yeah. how is this going to serve me? Do I need to abstain from it completely? Do I need to um, take control of how I dose it? <laughs> um, how I allow it to communicate with me and enter my life? And in that sense, I think you're absolutely right. This technology is so powerful and it could absolutely facilitate deeper connections if we if we are just careful and yeah. deliberate about how we use it. And especially like when you're like, you talk about starting, starting up this nonprofit, right? And like so much of like 
advertising and marketing and things like that have to be done through that and your source of communication you mentioned your facebook groups and mm -hmm. things like that text messages um, almost the whole program is run on text essentially messages. your livelihood <laughs> is conducted through that iphone over there um and i'm as guilty as anybody else in a sense that like um I, I use it, I, I use it strictly for like this, this podcast stuff. Like prior to this podcast, prior to this recovery, I really didn't have any social media accounts at all. Um, or prior to recovery, I guess. And I learned that like many, I learned of the um, information that was out there about recovery. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I like slowly started to integrate myself into it. But I try to be intentional with it like when I'm out in public, mm -hmm. when I'm with somebody. Like when we got here, I like put it in the little case over there. Mm -hmm. When I spend time with my girlfriend, it's like in the room charging. You know, mm -hmm. like, I try to like do it, but then it's like, I don't know. I, I just, I want to know, like, because it's, there's no getting away from it. Yeah. Right. Moving forward five years, 10 years down the road, like, and sea healing is growing nationally and you're opening um, chapters who you knows across the country like that's going to be a source of communication with each other like I, I just don't know I don't know what it looks like but yeah. I'm like, fascinated with like how can we change the just like you're doing with the approach to recovery the approach to addiction how can we change the way that we use that tool to mm -hmm. benefit to benefit us. I kind of got off on the tangent about the technology, just no, because I'm fascinated with it. It's fair, and um, I think it's very relevant, you know, to this whole topic of connection. Um, yeah. It's extremely relevant. Because, <laughs> back to what you said, the opposite of addiction is connection. And so, like, I guess the question I would pose is, like, if you're using it in an intentional way to communicate with your loved ones, friends, family, whoever, whomever, um, in an intentional way, is it still connection? Mm -hmm. Is it still an authentic connection? Like if I'm there, um, my sister 700 miles away, down in Tampa, Florida, just going through some stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And we're talking on a regular basis and I'm like listening, you know, like is that an authentic connection? I think it can be. I think that you start to peel back the layers of like, the full spectrum of connection that's possible mm -hmm. depending on the medium that you're using um but i think one of the only things or the thing that can be dangerous about a connection that's completely text-based is that well i guess two things you a you get you're losing a lot of the um richness of data that comes through a connection you're limiting it completely to linguistic data and specifically orthographic linguistic data so written text versus if you have a phone call then you're opening it up to you know audible linguistic data but you're still losing um, a number of the wavelengths that are present in human speech when we talk to each other and our brains pick up on all of that information right you open up to facetime or use a high quality bandwidth communication network um, then you end up capturing all of that audio data and now you're starting to get visual data as well but there's still something that's missing, right? Even in that FaceTime connection, which is a lot better, you know. Um, like I was sharing with you that I don't, I have no interest in doing Skype interviews. Right, because there's something, yeah. there's also energetic data that mm -hmm. we share with each other when we're physically present with each other. So, I don't know, for me, it's like, you know, each of these different ways of communicating, I'm going to take all of them. Like, I, I text with so many people and <laughs> I, uh, I treasure those connections, but I'm grateful for the technology for allowing me to stay in communication and to listen to people who I love who are far away. Um, but the danger that it can potentially create is if you're already in a pattern of communicating in a way that's full of expectation, um, either of others or just a lot of expectations that you're exerting on yourself and um, shame that you feel around you know, not being enough or how you show up and in communication, in relationship, uh, Texting can really exacerbate, or text-based communication can really exacerbate some of those patterns um, and make it more difficult. But I don't think that that means it's worth giving up on. I think it's just another opportunity for us to go deeper and 
be more deliberate. You hit on something a couple times tonight. Mm. Shame. Shame. Huh? Oof. An important... Critical topic in recovery and addiction healing. In a kind of a target that this connection helps you overcome, address, I believe so. Change the change the narrative. I one hundred percent believe so. I, in listening, we talk about how the single greatest in listening training. We talk about how the single greatest barrier to authentic connection is shame. Yeah. Shame that we, um, yeah, an experience of shame, or you know how it shows up the most often <laughs> is uh, awkwardness. That feeling of social awkwardness. Have you ever had that moment where you mess up? I did it just earlier today. I was talking about the dust on the ceiling fan over there, and it was like the feeling fan. You know, I mixed up my consonants uh-huh. or whatever. Or if you mix up two words in one sentence, um, and like you're talking to somebody, especially someone you don't know that well, it's like really socially awkward in that moment. You like, do you decide to just not acknowledge it and kind of blow past it? And and if you do that, then it's like you both know that something happened, but you didn't uh-huh. acknowledge it, and so it like feels awkward, right? And that awkwardness, I think that's one of the best, like, really easy to hold on to examples of shame and how that can come up in a conversation. And then, of course, there's all the bigger ones, right? The shame of being an addict, the shame of going through a divorce, the shame of, you know, not having the job that you think you should have or not making the kind of money that you think you should make. All of these things perpetuate a way of connecting and speaking to each other that's just fundamentally inauthentic. Yeah. Um, I'm the kind of guy that, like, leans on it leans on humor so like i'll like try to crack a joke around one of those things that happen or to like just like stumble through it and like laugh at myself yeah right um yeah that's really cool when that happens right because in that moment you're um you're drawing attention to it mm-hmm. you're saying look at this thing that happened isn't that hilarious and yeah. especially if it's a little bit self-deprecating or like yeah. pointing to yourself it's like now actually now it's a moment where you can connect because mm-hmm. you're sharing with the other person the experience of making a mistake of so being a human. It's an opportunity. I'm a human. It's an opportunity. Yeah. That's uh-huh. right. All of those moments, every single time we experience awkwardness, oh man, I hope that this comes out through the podcast and nothing else. Every single time you experience a moment of social awkwardness or social anxiety or maybe even something worse like passive aggressive speech, it's an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Every single one of those moments is an opportunity to get real yeah. and to connect with somebody if you just have the courage to be like, well, what's really going on here? Yeah. I've really, like, within, that's something that I've worked on within the last, or, like, noticed or recognized within the last, like, year, year and a half, is that, like, I challenge myself that every single time um, that I feel uncomfortable, mm. I make myself do exactly what it is that's making me feel uncomfortable, okay? Like, the things that, in, in active addiction, I would avoid the shit out of them. Like, I would I would just bail, disappear, mm-hmm. get out of here, fight or flight, like, bail out of here, time to roll. Well, that's what addiction is. And so, like, today, I, school starts on Monday, and there's I made some changes to my schedule, and, like, some things have been, like, happening that we have to make some adjustments. And so, like, I had to go, school starts Monday, I had to go and speak to my advisor, this afternoon, I got off work, went and met with her, and then I came here to your house, and I was dreading the conversation. Like, I, it was just, I was not hurt with her, not with you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I got that, I got that. <laughs> um, I just, like, did not want to have it, right? And so, like, all day long, I was just, like, telling myself, I'm like, no, you, you're going to go in there, and you're going to, like, own up to, like, what is going... You're going to be honest with her. Mm. You're going to mm-hmm. go into her office because you don't want to. Like, mm. I was just reminding myself, as kind and, like, gentle as possible. It took a long damn time to learn this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was like, I have... You're going to go into her office, and you're going to be completely honest with her. And you're going to tell her, like, why things need to be this way. And why we're gonna, why you're going to make these changes. Mm. Um, it had a lot to do with like the my time commitment with like what I'm doing with this and mm-hmm. like, my time commitment with other things. It was just like it was just a conversation. You just set some boundaries yeah, for yourself. I just yeah. Said, yeah, somewhat like I mean she to- it, you know, there's no reason why I was feeling that way. She totally supports everything <laughs> that I do, but it was just like it was the way I was feeling. Yeah. And I was just like I totally just wanted to like, get in my car and drive to Asheville mm. and like not <laughs> go there and do it and just like all right, I'll just show up for class Monday and deal with it. But like I just I wasn't 
feeling like I was ready to have the conversation. And so I was just like, mm. oh, Steve, be kind to yourself. You, you don't want to have this conversation. So it's, you have to go in there and be honest. Yeah. Because, and I don't like, I don't know where that came from. I don't know why. I don't know if it's through um, the, you know, multiple years of steady meditation and I don't know. I don't know when, why. The practice, like, the journey of being a seeker. When I feel uncomfortable, it's not like there's no like forcing, you know, it's as gentle as possible. Like, okay, um, you don't want to go to the gym today. Guess what you're going to do? <laughs> you're going to go to the gym today. You don't want to sit it's in the morning. You don't want to sit. Guess mm. what you're going to do? You're going to sit. Like the things that I don't want to do. I really have learned to like lean into them and like take mm. action. You see, I got a buddy now too, huh? Yeah, yeah. He he, he chose you over me and, and offended. Are you really? Uh huh. Mm-hmm. The stink bug has migrated, ladies and gentlemen. If you're curious about what's happening. <laughs> I, you can see him. He's getting. <laughs> oh yeah, we have video. I forgot yeah, about it's that. It's over there. <laughs> it's over there. Uh-huh. Um, no, it's really real, Steve. It's really, really real. It reminds me of something else that I uh, often. Have you ever heard of the Four Agreements? I have, and I, I I haven't read it, but I've heard mixed reviews, to be mm. honest with you. Yeah, I, uh, I I totally understand the mixed reviews. So the they changed my life. I'm a, mm-hmm. a big believer. Um, recap number one is use your words to say exactly what you mean to say. Two is take nothing personally. Three is make no assumptions. And four is always do your best. And they're brilliant, except I think what they leave out and what the mixed, where the mixed reviews come from a lot are uh, the part where that just means that you could live in your own little bubble in your own little universe and be just fine and really not connect with anybody connection's else. Gone. That connection's gone, right? Mm-hmm. So I, very boldly, excuse me, Don Miguel Ruiz, I respect you and all, but I added an agreement <laughs> to this right. list. Now um, I can get down with this. Come on. <laughs> and it reminds me what you are just talking about. So for me, rule zero, I call it agreement zero before any of the other stuff comes into play is if it feels awkward to say or you're worried it's going to make the other person feel mad or bad, you absolutely have to find a way to say it. And then you can apply rule one, use your words to say what you mean to say. You know, But it all starts with why are you even going to speak to begin with if it's not to connect mm-hmm. and to forge a meaningful relationship with yeah. somebody. And for some people it's difficult. Not to say it, but for others to receive it. Mm. What do you mean? There's people people in my life, my boss, mm. um, who like, no matter, like I, I just, I try so hard. She might be watching, sometimes she does. And I'm sorry, Sheree. I, I you know, say what you say, what you mean. Or being you, authentic. Mean, mean what you say. <laughs> but like, I try like so hard to like, be as kind and like, connected and gentle and like, just communicate healthy with her and it's hard it's mm. really really hard to do um, she tends to like no matter how I approach no matter how I approach the conversation she tends to like t- receive the message in a way that I did not intend it to, mm. to be received maybe in a way of taking it personally it sounds like yeah Sometimes, yeah. Now he's in my beard. <laughs> Man, this little guy is not leaving us alone. He wants some air time. <laughs> he's like, I got things to say. Um, and you know, you the know answer, like, they might not receive what you're... Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I would, and that's why I love what you were just saying about digging into what's harder and uh, why it reminded me of this rule zero, like when it feels awkward, if it feels bad. What I love about both these things we're saying that's... A sense that we both created this trigger for ourselves, basically like a a cognitive trigger. When it's hard, go deeper, right? Yeah. And I guess what I would offer you, you know, that's what, what I would offer you <laughs> in my communication pattern is um, when it feels like that, how can I be more real and more authentic about what my experience is right now? So like, uh, Sheree, mm-hmm. Sheree, I am I'm feeling like you are really uncomfortable in this uh, right now, or like uh, you don't like what I'm saying, and you know, just calling out whatever it is um, in the in the right here, right now. Yeah. It's a challenging practice. Try, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
You made it through the hour without uh, one single word from your parent. Oh my gosh, George, you're being so quiet over there. We do have a parrot in the room. There's a parrot right behind me. George, I think he's sleeping. We, we have never had a bird speak on NC Raw before. I was hoping you get a couple words out. I want to get him to talk. Hey, George. George. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen. You want to wrap this thing up? <laughs> yeah. Okay. This has been awesome. Thank yeah. you, Steve. I appreciate the offer. I really do. Mm. I'd like to do more out here, so like maybe like we could do like a seeker event, like I'm doing yeah. tomorrow. So tomorrow, um, anybody that's watching live tomorrow, we're gonna be at Making Hole mm. at Jeremy's French's studio to do like a podcast and a lunch. But I want to do more stuff like that. So like maybe we'll do like a seeker event. Yeah, that would be awesome. Or something like that. And I think there's a it. number of seekers who would, uh, if you would have a lot of fun uh, having them on the show as well. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Jennifer. You're amazing. It was a wonderful dinner and conversation. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Y'all have a good night. Thanks for tuning in to NC Raw. Oh, where can everybody find you? Hold on. Hold on. Back, oh, yeah, back, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How can uh, people get in hold of, a hold of you if they want to be a seeker, go through training, mm. catch up with your events, all that stuff? Well, you can check out. There's lots of information on our website, seekhealing.org. Uh, we also have a Facebook page, Seek Healing. Um, but the best way to just get start, signed up uh, and get started in the program is to call our phone number, which is 828-547-0222. Uh, you can call or text that number. It's 828-547-0222. Whether you want to volunteer and help, um, whether you're in long-term recovery and need more support yourself, whether you just are feeling isolated in your life and need more connection uh, or if you're in early recovery if you've gone through a detox in the past six months um, need extra support as uh, you're making that transition please reach out uh, call or text anything like hey what's up I'm ready I want to talk I, you can text an emoji if you feel like it whatever you want 828-547-0222 uh, beautiful thank you so much Jennifer you're a badass We'll see y'all tomorrow. Thanks, Dave.